Speaking of the checklist, four tickets to the WVU game against Penn State, August the 31st, Section 103. The bid right now at $1,250. We'll give these uh, away to the highest bidder. All of the money, every single penny, goes to the Berkeley County Backpack Program, which helps kids who don't have enough uh, to eat to eat when they get home. They put, in the, put the food in the backpack. The backpacks go home. And that kid eats, and a lot of times their siblings do too. And it might, over the weekend, be the only food that they get. So it's a great job by the Berkeley County Backpack Program and all of their volunteers. They have no paid employees at all. Every dollar donated goes to buying food so these kids have it. And that's uh, as important as you can get. You can't learn uh, when you're hungry. Mm -hmm. you got to have a little bit of food in the belly so that you can concentrate on your academics there. We are in studio with Dr. Ryan Sachs. He is the superintendent of schools in Berkeley County, and this is his first year doing this. We welcome you, sir, for your third appearance on the program. Second with me. We're keeping track That's of right. this. That's right. We're keeping track. Yeah, man. It's good to be here. I think we're three for three. You are. are. We three for three, Bill? We are We've that. We've been yes, all yes, three. Yes, we are. Yes, you we come are. on Wednesdays. You That's get right. these guys. That's right. Most of the time, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're pretty consistent with that there, too. So starting a new school year, this isn't the first time you've ever been a superintendent. Uh, no. So you've done this before in a pretty good-sized school district, too. Uh, here in Berkeley County, what have you observed for your first week of school here? Well, um, prior planning has definitely paid off. Mm -hmm. um, we had a great, smooth start to the school year. Obviously, you have your, your traditional hiccups and, and bumps. Um, you know, sometimes the school bus is a little bit delayed because there are you know, trying to figure out their routes or drop off might be a little, you know, wonky. But for the most part, everything went very smoothly for our first day in Berkeley County Schools. Um, and, I, you know, I've, I've visited many different schools and campuses. And um, the one thing that was consistent was everybody was just excited to be back. Um, our, our, our faculty and our staff um, love our kids and our kids love our faculty and staff. So you can definitely see that. Uh, between our students and our, our uh, teachers and our counselors and our administrators. But everything went very well, and um, we, uh, I think, have a solid foundation for a great school year. What is your situation with uh, permanent, permanent subs to start the year or even temporary subs in classrooms? Well, like I said, we, we greatly reduced the number of permanent substitute positions from last year. Um, and so um, we have, I, I want to say it was about 170 permanent substitute positions in the county. Now, you know, sometimes that's misleading because you think of a permanent sub, you don't realize that some of those are retirees that are certified or individuals that are certified that they just don't want to work full time, you know, so they, um, they, they'll, they'll take on a long-term position until we can fill somebody. So, um, we also have really, really focused on a support, um, a support embedded support for those permanent subs, um, with, um, a, a mentor teachers, um, uh, to help them focus on what they need for their content areas or for instructional strategies. And then as it relates to short term, um, you know, uh, vacancies, um, we've greatly reduced that to down to like four or five classrooms mm -hmm. and those are in special ed. And so we um, are working with the special ed office to be able to, to uh, address those situations in those positions where there's not been a teacher um, that has been able to be hired or secured. Those students are, are having to unfortunately be routed to other programs. Um, but our hope is to be able to fill those, pro those actual positions at those sites to bring those school students to that, that site. And what is the situation with hiring uh, math and science teachers in Berkeley County? How difficult has that been? Well, I think that um, hiring math, science teachers um, across the state, across the nation is a challenge. Um, there's definitely a shortage, um, but you know we we um, have been able to accommodate those needs. You know it's shocking, but it's sometimes hard to find elementary teachers even anymore. Um, you know that that has been a trend that has been you know surprising to me over the last three or four years. So we have we have shortages everywhere. I mean it's not just math and science anymore. It's math, science, special ed, um, even social studies sometimes. So. Um, you know, I think that we've done a really good job this year of trying to make sure that our classrooms are um, staffed with high quality, um, highly qualified staff. And if um, certification or degree level isn't uh, where it needed to be, then we're working with them throughout um, the year in order to acquire certification or to make sure that they have the support mechanisms in place that the quality of instruction can still be at the expectation that um, everybody comes to expect. 
we had the Eric Kiesacker in last week in regards to transportation, and he had painted a much rosier picture for transportation mm-hmm. this year than the the year before. In fact, they've got, I think he said, 30 drivers that are in classes right now who right. will be able to step right in in a month or so when they're finished with their driving classes to help that situation even more so. What's the staff situation like with cafeteria workers and custodians and such? Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, we may have a few vacancies here and there for custodians, um, maybe a few for, uh, few for cooks, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, we're doing very, very well. Our biggest concern is actually um, classroom aides. We call them ECATs, um, early childhood education teachers. And um, that's really a direct result of the Third Grade Success Act, which I think I've talked about here on the show a couple times, is a wonderful piece of legislation. I mean, I really do applaud our legislators for having the foresight to um, create a piece of legislation that puts expectations in place for third grade reading readiness. Um, Now, there's obviously some parts of that bill that that could be improved as with anything, but it's a really good piece of legislation, but it actually puts an aid in every single kindergarten, first, second, and third grade classroom. Um, and it, it was, uh, sort of, uh, phased in. Um, so, uh, this year, um, we are adding ECATs to every second grade classroom. Next year will be every third grade classroom. And then it's done, correct? And then it's done. Well, the staffing part, phasing it in, and then it's full implementation. Um, and we can go into maybe greater detail about what that may look like. But what that required for us is to hire, you know, nearly 100 additional staff members in Berkeley just for this year. Last year, we had to hire an additional 100 for first grade. So looking at having to hire an additional 100 aides for classrooms is a pretty big challenge, especially when there's already a shortage. So um, we have approximately, I think, 30 or so positions that we still have to fill as it relates to those early childhood education teachers for second grade um, or, or first grade or, or even kindergarten or special ed. Because when you create that gap for second grade, people maybe that have been teaching kindergarten want to go to second grade or special ed. Oh, I want to go to a second grade classroom now as opposed to being a special ed aide. So we have to fill those positions. And so um, our HR department has just been relentless in trying to um, uh, recruit uh, individuals that want to come in and be able to provide, um, you know, an assistance to the teacher in the classroom, provide, provide instruction. And that's actually one of our big focuses for the year ahead is, is that as we, hire individuals into those classrooms as assistants is making sure that we are providing training to those individuals that mirrors what the classroom teacher is going through so they are true assistant not just a helper Mm -hmm. Um, and so we want to make sure that those positions are also supported so that when they choose that career path that they want to stay in that career path with Berkeley County Schools. Ron, the uh, uh, availability of these uh, uh, assistants notwithstanding, uh, is this covered by the part of the school aid fund, uh, funding, or are you, is this kind of a unfunded mandate? Well, it's, it's, um, it's partially funded. So we did get an increase in um, the uh, staffing allotment, but it's based upon the number of students, not necessarily the number of classrooms. So, you know, they may say for every, you know, 25 students, you're going to get an aid, okay? Um, and that may translate to, you know, let's say, you know, uh, that may translate to 80, cla- 80, 80 actual classroom aids that we would have. But based upon enrollment in our schools, we may have 100 classrooms. So the additional staff that we need because of, class size and those sort of things is an unfunded portion of the requirement. The other part of the Third Grade Success Act that's unfunded is the summer programming. So it does require that in every grade level up through third grade that if you if you're if you have a child that is um, below level that you uh, um, allow you require that they attend summer summer learning. Um, especially in third grade, and that will happen in two years when, or, or next summer, not this summer, but the next, um, that if a child in third grade is below level and has been identified as below level, they can't be promoted unless they go through a summer program and they show that they have actually attained mastery or proficiency of being able to read. 
And so the requirement of having summer programming in place is not funded through the Third Grade Success Act. And so that's a responsibility of the school district to be able to have to fund. And that's staffing, that's food, that's all those sort of things. Yeah. Go ahead, Talk Mary. a little bit about the what's the salary level for these aides and then what are the qualifications? Because we all know that it's difficult to hire anybody for anything yeah. these days. So, Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I would be remiss if I sat here and said I'm an expert on this, the exact uh, requirements for those positions. Um, what I can tell you, though, is, is that um, if you have a high school diploma and um, you have a good work ethic, then we're going to try to find a way that, that we can get you on board, whether it be an aide or a custodian or, or, or whomever in the, in the school district. And then that will afford you the opportunity to bid on other positions. So um, I would like to be able to get that information and bring it back to you so that we can be very clear as to what those, those, um, uh, res those certif the requirements would be. You do have to pass a competency exam that we provide to you. Uh, but as it relates to salary, I, I'll come back and I'll bring that to you because I want to be I want to be clear on that. Because you know, if you're paying aides what you can make at Sheets, not that that's a comparable job or anything, but you know, it is difficult. There's a competitive um, competition for every job out there these days. You're so. exactly you know you're exactly right. I think that um, you know it, I think that the rewards of working with kids is much greater. I think that it also, um, you know, some people are called and um, a lot of times they find that, hey, this is actually something I'm really good at. Um, so the rewards there, I think, are much better than some of the other service items that are, could be out there. The other thing I would say is, is that the benefits of being a public school employee are still really, really good. Um, you have retirement, um, you know, you have uh, health insurance, um, and then, of course, in Berkeley County, you also have dental and vision. So there are um, a lot of other perks that, when you look at it, um, can sure. make Berkeley County schools or the public school system in general a much better option. Um, you just have to be, you have to be able to compare apples to apples and um, see what other benefits are actually available with that salary. The other thing that I found interesting at the new teacher's breakfast, having attended that for a number of years, and then this year, the the new teachers who were at my table, I don't know if this was just an anomaly, but they had done other things. These mm -hmm. weren't your 22-year-olds coming out of college being like, okay, here I go. One was a banker for a number of years. Um, one had worked, I can't remember the other career path, but these were not your typical, um, you know, 21, 22-year-olds yeah. coming into, into the, they were, they had been trained as educators uh, most recently, but but this was another career path for them. And I'm always intrigued by that too. Yeah. It was really kind of neat to talk to them. It is, you know, a second career folks is something that um, I think that we have been able to attract. Um, and I think it's because of, of several different things. Sometimes it's because, again, they're called. They say, you know, this is something that I want to try. Um, or they they have a family member that is that has been in, in the system and they they themselves have shared success stories or or what have you. But I also think that they see the benefits and the rewards that can occur. Um, and and so looking for a refreshed career opportunity um, is something special. I think the other thing is is because we have pathways toward certification um, within the school systems so that if you're not certified that you can apply and get a, a rewarding position as a teacher in the school system and earn your certification while you're working is is attractive and of course the other thing is is that when you think about the salaries and the benefits there is a lot of opportunity for career a career salary advancement as it relates to degree level years of experience and then even you know being able to move up the ladder into um, areas of supervision or or leadership um, so i think that that upward mobility is also attractive for dr people ryan well. Sachs is our guest here on the program superintendent of schools in berkeley county which has a new cell phone policy for this upcoming school year dr Sachs, so far any feedback on the first couple of days of school and how that's gone well, I will tell you, you know, anytime that you create a new uh, policy or something like that, it can bring apprehension. Um, but, you know, the, 
the decision for us to look at cell phone uh, being a cell phone and, and electronic device free school system or, or learning uh, system is really rooted in what the research shows is and that is is that um, when students have a device regardless of whether they're on it the fact that it's in their pocket and they're expecting a message or needing feeling they need to check social media for the latest whatever it may be can bring anxiety and lack of focus on instruction or or what it is that they're working on in the classroom and so uh, taking that away um, so that during instructional time students can focus on learning um, and uh, not have that as a um, not have that as a distraction is extremely important it has been very positive. It has been extremely positive. Um, I think that everybody sees that, um, I, I, I want to say most people see the benefits. Um, I think our students actually probably get it for the most part. They may be a little frustrated to start with, but we, you know, at the middle school and high school level, there have been opportunities so that be, before school, after school, and at lunch, you know, they have the flexibility to um, have those devices if, if that's something that they want. Um, and I think that teaches responsibility, responsible usage. You know, just as if we're sitting in here and you're at work, you're not having personal conversations with friends or family or checking out social media or anything like that because you're focused on the work. We want to be able to teach our students that you have to focus on the work. There's a time and a place and there's responsible, you know, responsible usage, and that's what we're trying to reinforce. Ohio County got is receiving quite a bit of visibility to being the first in the state to implement this uh, iPhone policy. Uh, how many counties have implemented it? Do you know? You know, I don't. I, I, what I, I, it's anecdotal at this point. No. Um, I know that Montgomery County has implemented um, a similar policy. Uh, Ohio County, um, and I know other counties are looking at it. The the West Virginia Department of Education is looking at developing a policy for school districts to follow. I don't anticipate that the state policy will be anything that would be, you know, uh, restrictive from giving local flexibility. It's probably going to be something like a county needs to have a policy in place to bring consistency. So, um, you know, I work very closely with Superintendent Kim Miller um, in Ohio County. She and I actually served. I was the, the president of the Superintendent Association last year. She's, uh, she was the vice president. She's actually the president this year. And so as a superintendent group, we work really closely together and we share best practices. Um, and so I applaud Ohio County for being the first to sort of step their foot into this. And I also want to thank our board, our Berkeley County board, because they too um, saw the need for this. And, you know, we can develop any policy or practice, but unless it's going to be reinforced um, from our board um, and from the district leadership, then it's just not going to be successful. And there's a tremendous amount of support again, uh, support for making sure that we are consistently applying this process and this procedure. Where do students put their phones, Dr. Sachs, if they're allowed or permitted in the morning, at lunch, at the end of the day? I mean, is there a basket in the office? Um, in a locker or yeah, where's so it go? So for our elementary uh, students, um, we are asking that they put them either in their backpack or in their locker or in their cubby. So it shouldn't be on their person during during the school day. Um, but if there's a, a situation where they need it, they can go to their teacher and say, hey, there's a situation, I, you know, may I? And they, they can, under those extenuating circumstances, perhaps. Um, but there's also the school office. So they can go down and make a phone call home from the school office or what have you. At the middle school and high school level, it's a little bit different. It just has to be off and away. So that may mean that it's in their pocket or in their book bag or in their locker or wherever, but it has to be off um, and away, not visible. Now, some teachers may have the discretion of saying, you know what, when you come in, here's a basket. I'm going to ask you to put it in here. When you leave, you can get it. Um, that That's a provision in the policy that, that is allowable. Um, but, you know, in general terms, it's often a way in the middle school and high school level not being able to be seen. Uh, that affords them the opportunity that during lunch if they need to use their device for whatever reason that they can have easy access to it. They're not having to go down to a, a locker or what have you. Dr. Ryan Sachs, our guest here on the program. Berkeley County Schools have begun the school year as of uh, Monday, and we anticipate more than 20,000 students going through the doors. Uh, how is the process of, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, the hardening of the schools uh, been as uh, we begin this school year? Have more schools 
effectively achieved that level of security? Oh, I, I think so. You know, first of all, before I became superintendent, you know, we um, here in Berkeley um, did a really good job of, with our school bond dollars, uh, putting in safe school uh, secure entrances. We call them man traps, which is where a, a person can't have access to the entire building when they come in. Um, so that's a, that was a great first step. Um, it's also about following the process and procedures that you've established that keep kids safe. So one of the big things that we have really focused on for this school year ahead is, is that all classroom doors after school bell rings stay locked. They're, they're not staying open. Um, if there's a, a class change, they obviously open the door. They keep the door open during the class change. But as soon as class starts, the door is shut and the door is locked. That is because if someone was wanting to cause harm and they do gain access to the building, there's yet another barrier to prevent them from going in and, and causing harm in a classroom. Um, and so that has been a protocol that's been established and it will be monitored. You know, the other thing is, is that we have a team of uh, school district safety folks that We'll be doing periodic audits in the schools. So um, they'll, they'll come in, they'll make sure, are all the perimeter doors locked, staying locked? Um, going in, are all the classroom doors locked? Um, have they been uh, following the appropriate procedures for fire drills or for lockdown procedures? And we do have um, a new um, uh, emergency code system that we've released. Uh, we recently updated our emergency protocol practices and our language to ensure that we're fully prepared for any potential hazards. And parents, uh, staff, they can locate those uh, on our school district website. Uh, we've also done some push notifications to families to make sure they're aware of it. Um, and these protocols are established to be able to quickly address and mitigate threats whether it be um, an erroneous phone call threat or it be uh, a student making an offhanded comment that could be taken seriously um, to a realized threat where someone is on campus and we need to go into an emergency lockdown. So uh, those protocols are established on our website and I encourage people to go check them out. Um, and, um, but yes, that, our first priority is keeping kids and staff safe every single day. Um, followed very closely by making sure that we have high quality instruction. But, you know, as a parent myself, you know, when we drop our kids off at school, we, we want to trust that our kids are in the safest place possible. And I can tell you in Berkeley County schools, our students are safe because our staff are following the uh, best practices of keeping kids safe, uh, following protocols to ensure that if a crisis was to occur, that they know how to react. Um, and, and that's thankful to our partnerships with local law enforcement, emergency management, FBI, Homeland Security. Um, we, we have unique partnerships with those entities in order to make sure that we are well prepared should something happen um, at one of our school sites. Have you had any 30, threats? I'm sorry. We have 30 seconds left, so final word is yours. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say thank you to all of our families. Um, and our staff uh, for a great start to the school year. Families, we can't do it without you. And, um, you know, as we continue to provide the very best education possible for our students, um, we need to hear from you about uh, ways that we can always improve. So we look forward to having that, that dialogue and we're just ready for a great school year. So let's go Berkeley. Dr. Sachs, thank you very much. We appreciate your time as always. Thank you, sir. Have a thank good day, all. sir. Dr. Sachs will be making regular appearances on the program throughout the school year, and we appreciate that, and Carla Trotman, too, for setting all that up for us.